gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I am back on the Beyond Solitaire podcast with a special guest this week. Uh, I have Professor Jonathan Truitt. He is Professor of Latin American History. He's also the Director of the Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations at Central Michigan University. How are you doing, Jonathan? Good. How are you doing, Liz? I'm doing all right. Happy to have you here. So you are an expert on gaming in... 16th and 17th century Mexico. Is that about right? Yeah, I. it's my current research topic. So I started out as a historian of religion in colonial Mexico, and I look at uh, the Nahuas. Nahuas are the uh, people who are the Aztecs. Their language is Nahuatl. Not all Nahuas were Aztecs, but all Aztecs were Nahuas. Uh, sort of like not all Greeks were Athenians, but all Athenians were Greeks. Um, and so after finishing my first book, I was looking to get away from religion, and uh, I decided to start looking at the board games people played in colonial Mexico and the interactions around those board games. Uh, spoiler alert, I found out that uh, games are tied to religion, and my effort to run away failed horribly. Um, but it's really exciting and fun. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say games, what kind of games are we, are we talking about? What are the options for games in this time period in place? So I'm looking at um, both the games that Spaniards bring to Mesoamerica, but I'm also looking at the games that Mesoamericans play and introduce Spaniards to. So the classic one that people are aware of for colonial Mexico is Patoli. Uh, it's a bean throwing game. It's a bit like Sori uh, today, or it's actually very close to Parcheesi. Uh, there's an interesting twist that might come about that that I can talk about later, too. Uh, we also have a, what's clearly a sport called Tlachli. Um, it's a ball game. Uh, every time I read about it, it feels vaguely like Quidditch uh, in some ways, or Quidditch feels vaguely like Tlachtli. They have rings that are set up, uh, and you have to get the ball through those stone rings, and you do it by uh, bouncing the ball off of your hips and legs. So it's sort of like if if Quidditch were on the ground, but it's not quite soccer, uh, So because you're supposed to keep the ball airborne. It's like anyway. advanced hacky sack. Yeah, that would be even a better <laughs> one. With you, know, you have to get it through goals, and there's a possibility that you get sacrificed at the end. You know, so <laughs> um, so those are the two main games. There are some others that I've been uncovering, and then there's sort of a definition of what is games that I look at for Mesoamerica. Um, but then I'm also interested in interactions around cards and dice and chess and sort of European games as they come over to Mesoamerica and sort of those cultural interactions that happen around a board game table, right? So anybody who's played a board game like there's that social aspect of it um and if you play a board game once with somebody you don't like you don't go back and play a game play again with them they just don't have your play style you might but you know it's not something you want to continually return to but there are people who are returning to these games with the same people day in and day out and they're from different backgrounds and so how are these relationships forming and what does that do to the formation of um the new culture that's emerging in mesoamerica so when I think about colonial travel to Mesoamerica, I normally think of that in terms of hostility and in terms of abuse and ill treatment. At what point are these people who are not treating local residents very well playing games with them? So, yeah, I don't want to, this has been one of the challenges. I, I'm not trying to minimize the colonial violence, right? There's all sorts of violence in terms of colonialism, uh, but not all human interactions are bad in situations. Again, I'm not trying to minimize that, but uh, as I started looking at games, and there's violence around games too, right? People are going to get into fistfights over card games, and they're going to stab each other and things like that. Like, there's that aspect of it, but I'm I'm really interested in these like one-on-one -on -one sort of just interactions where people are playing games and sitting down. So it starts immediately uh, with Cortez and his Spaniards when they show up. Uh, when the first example I have of games being played between Spaniards uh, and Nahuas is actually there's this period where Cortez is in Mexico, Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, which becomes Mexico City. And they're in Moctezuma's palaces. And the Spaniards are introducing Moctezuma to games, and Moctezuma is introducing them to games. Uh, in fact, Moctezuma uh, accuses Pedro de Alvarado 
uh, Hernan Cortez's uh, right hand man of cheating uh, in scorekeeping. Uh, so, so we even have examples of that. Uh, we have uh, it, it hurts a little bit. There's a Spaniard who's going to take drum heads. Uh, so these pre-contact drum heads and he's going to cut them and make playing cards out of them. So he makes decks of cards because Spaniards were expressly forbade from being able to take dice or card games with them on these entradas as they are known. Uh, but they're going to play games. They're going to do it. People need something to do in their downtime, right? And in war uh, and in fighting, there's downtime. And so one of the things they do is they, they introduce each other to games, even their enemies. So that's that's the earliest stage. And then games just continue because that's people play. What kind of sources are you looking at to find information about these kinds of cultural interactions? Yeah, so um, I look, I'm looking at a number of different things. So uh, I'm an ethno historian. So I work specifically with native language documents, uh, as well as Spanish language sources, uh, I have the benefit of archaeologists who have done a lot of work on Patoli. So I'm going to use archaeological records, but I'm using uh, probably the best well-known primary source that I'm using is the Florentine Codex, which is essentially a 12-volume encyclopedia recorded in 1570, well, the 1570s range because it's over a period of time, by Bernardino de Sahagún, who's a Franciscan friar, and a number of Nahua scribes which a number, a lot of work has been done trying to uncover them, but we don't know exactly which portions they write. Uh, so that source has proved really important for understanding the pre-contact period. Uh, there's a number of other sources that are written in Nahuatl and in Spanish during the colonial period that are going to also prove useful. There's an author by the name of uh, Don Domingo uh, Don Domingo de San Antonio Munion Chimal Pajin Cuautle Juanitzin try that one a couple of times. Uh, he is the most prolific indigenous author um, in Mesoamerica, if not the Americas. Uh, and so he left us a lot of really good sources and just there, he doesn't, he doesn't specifically talk about playing games, but there are like these tidbits of pieces where it comes up. Uh, there's Franciscans and Dominican, so priests, Catholic priests who are writing their accounts. Uh, one of my favorites comes from Fray Diego Duran, and he just, he's really concerned about the games that they're playing, and he's concerned about the indigenous aspects of them and their ties to uh, demons and things like that. But one of my absolute favorite pieces that comes out of this is he's sitting in service and watching uh, and listening to one of his brothers give uh, the sermon. And he looks down, and he he then later records this in his book. There there are a couple of Nawas sitting on the ground, and they've they've drawn a patoli board in the dirt, and they're playing patoli during the sermon. <laughs> this sounds like me as a child if my parents would let me. So <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's it's that classic like you know as kids, you know, you're playing tic tac toe and whatever else in the pews as you're sitting there and you know trying to find things to do. And you're, but you know these are grown adults who are just like okay, God, I'm let's just play a game, right? And they're and they're creating the patchouli board there in the dirt, right? <laughs> and, yes, and playing while the sermon's happening. <laughs> and and <laughs> wh where it gets even better is um, the friar acknowledges that, you know, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's sort of that like, yeah, it was pretty boring, right? Uh, I, I don't blame them completely for, you know? <laughs> but also, I mean, the language barrier has to have been there too. Nobody wants to sit there and listen to someone drone on in a language that they may not fluently know. How do you yeah. even teach people games if half of the people speak Nahuatl and then half of the people speak Spanish? And how would, how do you even make it happen? So the start for games um, and this is going to come from Johan Huizinga and others who have really studied sort of games and play in human sort of culture and society. And it's the understanding is that games transcend cultural and language barriers, just like music does. So you think about music, right? You can hear somebody play an instrument um, and you can appreciate that it's music. And then even if you can't replicate that music, right? So I myself am no Taylor Davis when it comes to the violin, but I can see and hear Taylor Davis play and she's amazing, but I can't replicate that, but I can still appreciate that. Um, 
in the case of um, playing games, right, I can watch a game be played that I don't actually know how to play. And in watching that game play, I can still appreciate the game, right? If that gets my interest, I can continue to watch the game. As you can continue to watch the game, you start to pick up some of the rules of the game, right? But you also, games, especially if they're sort of simpler, you can you can show, right? So if you think about when you game with little kids and you're doing something like shoots and ladders, you throw the die, it has pips, right? And you count the pips and then you move the piece, that number of pips, and then you do the action based on where you're at, right? So you can show those actions, right? Um, so that's one way that it's going to happen. We don't know exactly, right? I, I don't have written down um, elements, but you're going to have um, a lot of people learning Spanish and Nahuatl. So, and this is a lot of the game exchange, at least the initial game exchange is going to happen between priests and um, Nahuas. And it's specifically, they're going to be elite members of the uh, Nahua society who are trained by uh, Franciscans and Dominicans and Augustinian and other priests. Uh, and they're they're trained in Latin and they're trained in Spanish. Uh, and then they teach the friars Nahuatl. And so one of the ways that they're doing this is they're learning games and having those conversations over games as they're teaching each other. Um, the first Latin grammar in Mexico City uh, has trying to remember the number of chapters. Um, I can't remember the exact number of chapters, but I believe two thirds of the chapters, um, the explanation of the Latin verbs and nouns and like are game references. So they're, they're teaching Latin um, in um, basically the University of Mexico in Mexico City in the 16th century uh, using, using gaming references. All right, so. Got wow, I've got to read that at some point. Seriously, that's so cool. <laughs> It's a great book. It's um, uh, it's it's been translated. I'm, I've got it here. I can I can get it for your link too if you want to see it. But it's um, so they. I mean, how they're doing it is they're doing it slowly, but they're also using it as a common point of reference, right? So if you think about, if you think about some easier games, right? The most complex game they're going to have at that time is chess, right? Uh, and chess is going to get taught. Chess is translated into Nahuatl by 1571. Uh, or 1572, somewhere around there. It's going to be translated into niche tech by the 1590s. Uh, so we're actually using dictionary entries, able to able to follow the introduction of chess to different indigenous groups in Mexico, uh, north and south. Um, and so they're doing that with chess. And if you think about how complex chess can get, but what you have to teach are the moves, right? And teaching the moves, you can show them without necessarily having to say them right so i have one more basic level question that i can think of at this moment there'll be more i don't know anything about this topic but um so you know i i come at history as somebody who studies latin greek coptic you know languages that are, are dead languages that have been transmitted through time but you know in across the atlantic ocean um so when you how do you learn nahuatl like, is it a language that's been continuously spoken and taught over the course of centuries? Or is it something like Coptic where people don't really speak it anymore, but you have enough translations and texts that somebody was able to work out how the language works? How do we, how do we know? How do you study those languages? So there's a slight divide. There's, um, there are still 2 million native Nahuatl speakers today, uh, just like there's over a million Maya, Maya speakers. Um, there's a bunch of different dialects of Nahuatl. It was a, so it was a pictorial pictorially written language. I'm going to say written because just because it was, wasn't an alphabetic script doesn't mean that it wasn't written. It was recorded um, prior to the Spaniards showing up. When the Spaniards get there, they alphabetize it in the Roman alphabet or in the Latin. Uh, and so it is then a written and recorded language until basically it's going to go past 1821, but at 1821 with independence, uh, the people who declare independence from Spain say, great, we're all Mexicans now, so we speak Spanish. Um, and they're going to remove indigenous languages from the legal record. Up until that point, um, Nahuatl was the lingua, the indigenous lingua franca. It was a legal language. And so we have lots of legal records in Nahuatl. Mixtec was, Zapotec was um, a number of languages. There's over 102 native languages in Mexico today. So 
uh, people interested in learning modern Nahuatl, uh, there is no codified modern written modern Nahuatl. Um, they're working to change that. There's um, a number of groups in Mexico who are working to cod codify that. One is EDS, uh, which is at the University of Zacatecas. They're doing some really great work. There's a, um, a group based out of the University of Warsaw in Poland uh, who are connected with EDS as well. And they're doing a lot of work to sort of get that changed so that there's sort of a modern um, equivalent. And right, the, the uh, INA, which is the National... Um, anthropological museum, sort of the equivalent of our Smithsonian in the United States, is also doing a lot of work where Nahuatl shows up in a lot of these indigenous sites or Maya, the, the appropriate indigenous language, right? So there's a lot of work there, uh, but the colonial is going to be a little bit different, right? There's a couple hundred years of remove. So I don't, I speak pieces of modern Nahuatl, but I'm, anybody who is a native Nahuatl speaker would just laugh at me. Um, or they might appreciate that I know it a little bit and then smile and say, let's speak Spanish. Um, so, so, uh, but the colonial, there's courses that you can take. And so that was part of it. I took um, a crash course at Yale uh, over the summer for my first one. And then in graduate school, uh, my advisor uh, is a Nawa specialist as well. She actually translated uh, most of the works of Chimal Pahin. Uh, and so I got a lot of training from her and from other scholars in the field. So that's how I learned it. Um, and then it's just sitting down and like slowly using grammars and dictionaries to work through the process. Um, I am not fast at Nala. You also must be humble because you're going to make mistakes. And it's a there's a really amazing community of people who support you and help you out. And like we pass each other our stuff and look it over and like provide feedback and um, you know, at one point uh, in this, I was looking at the translation uh, for chess in Nahuatl. And uh, initially, I thought the translation, so the word is qua patoli. Uh, and initially, I thought that it was uh, the patoli that makes your head spin because uh, you have patoli is a translation that they use for dice. Uh, patoli or ama patoli is the translation they use for cards. Uh, which means paper patoli. Uh, so there's this trend here with all European games having sort of, or European board games having patoli tied to it. So qua patoli, initially I thought it was the patoli that makes your head spin. Uh, one of my good colleagues looked at it and was like, mm, I think it's I think it's wood patoli. And so we sort of looked at it and we sat down and sort of started splicing things off because it's a head marking language and quickly figured out that, yeah, no, even though I like my first translation, that's wrong. Uh, and it's Wood Patoli. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Excellent. That's really, really cool. All right. So now that we've got some of this basic stuff covered, you said a few things throughout our conversation so far that I want to circle back to you because they sound interesting. So from the very beginning, you said that you were unable to escape religion as a topic when trying to switch to games. And you also mentioned that many of these first gaming interactions happened with clergy who were visiting uh, Mesoamerica. So can you explain a little bit more about the ties that you found? Yeah. So, um, right, as I started digging into this, it really came down to the, the sources. People don't, one of the tricks about history, we know a lot of the things that are sort of terrible about history. Um, and in part, we know about them because people are writing about the, the abuses. People in that time are horrified by it as well but also because we base a lot of our work on legal records. And if we go to legal records, we get all the bad stuff, right? So a lot of the work done on games has been around gambling and blasphemy, right? And the reason for that is because they're being written up in the Inquisition, right? So they've, they've gambled, they've blasphemed. Um, by the way, they knew how to curse way better than we do today. It's much more interesting. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so in order to start finding sources, Right, I had to I had to start digging around in different ways, and I uh, a colleague of mine pointed me uh, in the direction of some sources he found. Uh, so this is Chris Lane, and he uh, he found he was aware of a source uh, called the Gambling Scholar by uh, Cardano, and he writes sort of the first book on probability in games, uh, and I believe it's published in the 17th century. I could be wrong on that exact date, but it's written earlier than that. And it's a book on probability. 
And so I started looking at that book just to get a sense of sort of what the definition of early modern medieval games was. Uh, but in the process, I also come across uh, probably the two richest sources I have, uh, and they're confessionals. So these are books that priests write that help people who are Catholic know what they need to confess for what, right? So this is, what sins have you committed and why do you need to commit those sins? Or why do you need to commit those sins? No, that's not it. Why do you need to ask forgiveness for those sins? You probably shouldn't commit those sins. Uh, Don't tell me that. I was getting excited now. <laughs> I know. But, so, but that's the great thing about these two sources is um, they're both written in the 16th century. One is by a Dominican friar. One is by a Franciscan friar. And they're specifically confessionals for gamers. And so it's, what have you done while playing your game that requires confessing, right? And so there's this big conversation happening in the 16th century in Spain about whether or not it's okay to game. And one of the things they both assure you of is it is okay to game, right? Gaming is a good thing. It's what it helps you do is gaming helps you get away from uh, sort of the daily grind and allows you to rest. And that's okay, provided you then return to uh, sort of being productive. So uh, one of my absolute favorite things I've found so far is I learned that um, necromancy uh, in Spanish is a cognate in English. It's negromancia. Uh, and it is, according to uh, the Franciscan friar who's, who's writing the confessional Alcocer, um, it is not quite the worst sin you can commit while uh, gaming, but the second worst sin. And it's talking about, you know, whether or not you have uh, used images or rings with a necromantic fo fo focus to con uh, to speak to the spirits to uh, affect the outcome of the game, right? The worst sin you can, <laughs> the worst sin you can do is communing with demons. Uh, and there's pages on that where you shouldn't do that. So, um, all of this, as I'm looking into sort of their interactions with the Nawas and trying to understand what's going on, right? S the Spanish priests are really forming the definition of games and they're forming like the statement of what should, like where it's good to game, how it's bad to game. They're talking about role-playing games being good provided um, you're emulating the saints and not emulating like drunkards and gamblers. Uh, they're talking about uh, board games, like gambling games, and they're questionable, but higher end games like chess that sort of engage the mind are good. And so they then bring these ideas and specifically these two sources are cited in sources written in colonial Mexico. So we don't always know if sources written in Europe are used in um, the colonies in Mesoamerica in Central Mexico, Southern, uh, South America, we, we don't know where they're being used necessarily. But in this case, we have citate, we have books that cited them, uh, cited these two sources on discussions around uh, confessing and sins related to gaming uh, in Mexico City. And so you then, I in my previous book, I looked at uh, how people, um, one of the aspects was how Franciscans taught Nawas and what the Nawas took away from that, but I wasn't looking for games. Uh, but one of the things they use is theater. And so I started thinking about theater and role-playing, and I started looking specifically for like the use of games, right? And that's what took me to that, that uh, Latin grammar I told you about, um, and it took me to these confessionals. And so that's how I sort of stumbled into the friars and the priests doing it. Um, and then as I started looking for other sources, I mentioned dictionaries being written. Well, the dictionaries are being written by the intellectual elite of the society. And at this time, the intellectual elite of the society are the priests, right? And so as they move around, um, as they travel south to uh, modern day Oaxaca and meet the Mixtecs and the Zapotecs in that area, they write dictionaries on those languages. Well, one of the words they translate, they translate cards, they translate dice, they translate chess because they need somebody to play chess with because they're bored, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
And, and so this is like, you know, I thought I would get away from religion, but I mean, religion is ubiquitous. Everybody is practicing a faith of some sort, but it's also sort of, this is where people are engaging. I guess the final space that's really interesting for me, and this is sort of thinking about both societies, is that um, luck wasn't luck per se. Um, while Christianity sort of espouses the idea of like free choice, right? In a game, when you threw the dice, right? You had your choice was do you throw the dice or don't you throw the dice, right? But the outcome of that is sort of determined by by God, right? Should you win or shouldn't you win? God knows what it's going to be. And so when you enter into it, part of the reason blasphemy was so bad is that as those dice land and you lose, or as you throw that hand of cards and you lose, and you start going on a tear about the various different things that should happen, I'm, I don't want to offend people, so I'm not going to go into their blasphemy, but the various different things certain saints can do to each other. Um, like you're doing that to literally the face of God, right? It's, there's no remove there. Like today we say it and we're like, whatever, like there isn't this, but in that moment, like you're doing it to the face of God. And the same thing with the Nawas is that in real, in games, there's actually a God of, a God of games uh, who oversees games. There's two of them. Um, and in Patoli, when you cast the beans um, and there's pips on one side of the beam, if one of the beans ever lands and stands up on its side, right, um, you automatically win the game because the gods have decided that you should win that game, right? So the gods are present in the game as you play it. Um, my son jokes, we've played Patoli and they have little gambling cards with the, the Kirk Games version that's out of print, but, and we were gambling and I was crushing him. Like he just was not like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was merciless to my then eight-year-old, right? And we're using these little, you know, sort of pre-Mesoamerican, like, gambling cards to represent it. And Like, he's like, you should just bet the house. And I'm like, sure, I'll bet the house, right? Next throw, it lands on the side. And to this day, he's like, I own the house. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so God does not play dice with the universe, but does play dice, is what yes. I'm getting from this. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is really interesting. I was actually wondering if it was because you mentioned cards not being allowed on the ships and stuff. I'm assuming it's it's okay for these clergy to prevent gambling among the underlings, but their version of gaming that they've decided is okay is okay. Is that how I should understand this? To some extent. So gambling is a weird question. It's not that gambling is necessarily bad. Um, some gambling is bad. Again, it goes to that, like, they would prefer that you do something intellectual or something physical. But um, if you gamble, you should have the money to gamble. In part, when you gamble, you're also supposed to then take a certain amount of the proceeds of your gambling and redistribute that to the people who are poorer, who might be watching you or go give it to the church or the poorhouse, right? So in that like winning you're then helping redistribute some of the wealth that you're gaining from it which um in mesoamerican society this was actually very familiar the emperor would hold games uh that didn't involve sacrifice but would hold these games where both of plotchly where he was competing with people which right the, the ball game and the proceeds would go to the people who were watching right so he would he would gamble and his nobles would gamble and depending on who won that then got redistributed amongst the populace and this happened with Patoli as well where but in Patoli it was interesting because the the poorer members of society would their sort of their ante into the game so to speak was old clothing um and if Moctezuma won he gave his winnings to the people who bet on his side and if he lost um, if he lost, the nobles on the other side took the winnings and redistributed it to the people who were on Moctezuma's side. So the populace always bet on him, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because they then got, they got winnings no matter what, but it was this way for people in elite society to get more, like to get money and redistribute it. And 
the Spanish clergy also saw that where they had problems was if you were gambling yourself into debt or into slavery. And if you were, if you didn't have the money and you entered into it there, there was a bigger problem there. Um, now this, there's more nuance than that in some ways, because uh, like Cortez, right? The, the fabled Spaniard who is going to lead to the downfall of Moctezuma um, has this, has a, a poker table in his palace uh, and there's a regular gambling night. And at a certain point um, it's struck by lightning and he stops holding <laughs> gambling nights there because they take it as a, this is not something <laughs> we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> right. So um, yeah, there's interesting things happening there. Interesting. The other thing that you mentioned that I didn't push at the time I was tabling it um, is you mentioned that there's some discomfort later about sort of cross-cultural influence from the people in Mesoamerica to the Spaniards who who game with them. Uh, could you explain some more about that part? Yeah. So, um, right, we're going to have – Patoli is very much tied up with um, being a, a game – that ties in indigenous deities. Spaniards believe that they're demons and they're going to try and wipe out Patoli. They don't completely do that um, in a couple of different ways. So the indigenous peoples aren't going to just flip, right? They don't, they don't spontaneously understand Spanish culture. They don't spontaneously become Spanish. They engage with Spaniards based on how they understand life, right? You don't just suddenly stop being you or your background and you you engage in the way that you you know and similarly Spaniards are going to engage with them in the ways that Spaniards know and there will be conflicts there but um some of the interesting cases so there's again Fray Diego Duran um writes about a guy who does pin bowling right and they their bocce ball is going to show up and you have bowling but they call, they call it pin bowling shows up as well and he's going to have this conversation with him. And he quickly finds out that um, this pin bowler is a professional pin bowler. Uh, gambling is involved. Uh, this is how the guy makes his money. Uh, all of his pins are named. And he has ceremonies that he does prior to the engagement in the game um, that are really reminiscent of what Dudan was seeing people do with Patoli before beforehand and so Dudan is uncomfortable with this guy's interactions around bowling but he's a Nawa he's doing a European game and Dudan goes yeah I'm not happy with this he goes but if I'm being honest Spaniards do this stuff too right and so he's I mean it's not the same it's it's different but it's it's similar right and so there's there's discomfort in how these games are being adopted, but the games are still being like adopted in different ways. Right. And, right. and those, that engagement and that understanding, I mean, this is sort of the house rules effect, right. Where you introduce a new game and people play that game and they may not have read the rules. Right. I mean, I think about this a lot with um, the game Uno, like there's, there's sort of two, two places right there's there's the somebody you can't you can't play a card and everybody acknowledges that if you can't play a card you have to draw a card right but if you can't play that card that you just drew do you then draw another card and some households have you keep drawing until you can play a card others you draw a card and you're done I believe that's what the rules said. I looked it up at one point because I got so annoyed at the various different variations, but it's like house rules happen, right? And so house oh, yeah. rules in these colonial settings, right? And the ways you engage with these things. And so in this case, how do you treat the pins? How do you set up the pins? How do you engage with those pins um, are sort of house ruled. Um, and that's where you're going to get some different level discomfort. But I mean, this is also where, I mean, Dudon in the end sort of goes, yeah. And Franciscans, so Dudan is um, a Dominican. And I guess the difference is there's different, and I, I won't get into the weeds here, but these are two different branches of um, of 
friars and they have different views and they have different uh, ways in engaging it. And the, the Dominicans are very much more on the, this is a way things should be done than the Franciscans are. Uh, and there's a confessional on the Franciscans who they will confess, they will talk to people and indigenous and they're, they're going through the confessions and they're like, have you played, and this is a point where Patoli has been outlawed. Have you outlawed? Have you played Patoli? Have you played Tlachtli? Have you played Bulls, uh, which is um, lawn bowling, right? And then their concern is, isn't that you've played them. Their concern then is, and have you cheated at them, right? <laughs> have you done something to influence the outcome in them, right? And so the Franciscans are like, look, if you played the games, we don't care. But if you cheated at them, you need to confess that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so many confessions probably were needed for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Um, and then I have I have one more question. It's a topic that's come up a couple times, but we haven't really sat on it. And I understand why, because, so just background for me, when people talk about the Druids, as described by Julius Caesar, their favorite thing to talk about is the Wicker Man and human sacrifice, because that's a great way to sort of alienate others and kind of make them seem exotic and scary. And, you know, you've mentioned sacrifice a couple of times in the context of these games in Mesoamerica. How prevalent was that? What was the real significance of it? And like, where are scholars at today talking about that topic? So this topic uh, could be its own podcast or series of podcasts. Um, so we don't know how prevalent it's going to be. We don't even know how prevalent, like in terms of Tlachtli, there's questions about whether or not people are sacrificed they win the game if they lose the game um or how that works so and the answer is yes there's going to be sacrifices if they win or they lose part of understanding the sacrifices though is needing to understand the society and the culture so in christianity you have this idea of good versus evil right and it's this moral idea that good can overcome evil or evil can overcome good and in that process, there's the idea, though people don't necessarily acknowledge it, that one can be triumphant and therefore the other is gone, right? And so it's a battle to overcome. In Nawa society, uh, there isn't a good versus evil sort of dichotomy. Um, it's an order versus filth or an order versus disorder. So to get at that, you have, um, you have cleanliness, right? And so as sort of represented by um, civilization. And in cleanliness, right, you you clean your house, you keep everything clean. Um, but when you leave your house, right, so if you go on a trip somewhere, when you come back, there is necessarily dust and filth that you then have to clean again, right? You can't, one can't overcome the other. Similarly, as they look at it, right, there's life comes out of disorder and chaos, right? Sex is messy. Childbirth is messy, right? And so you have to have messy, you have to have filth. Uh, without it, life stops, right? But if you get too messy, right? If you drink too much, if you have too much sex, if you um, just don't take care of yourself, right? There's, there's danger in that as well. And so you balance those two items. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so that's what they're striving for is this balance between those two, okay? Now, with that understanding, right, um, you then sort of take that to the next level with deities. And deities sacrificed themselves for people, right? They became the sun, they became the moon, they became the plants, they be, right? Um, but deities need energy. They need to eat, right? And so if you think about, again, this is a very, very sort of slimmed down version of this. If you think about the way in which um, the world happens, right, people are often seen as sort of the top of the food chain, but we're we're not in this case. The gods are, right? And so the way that the gods eat, because the gods sacrifice themselves to the people, the way that they eat is by sacrificing people to the gods, right? Because if you don't then feed the sun, how does the sun keep going? Mm -hmm. um, so that's necessary. So in the context of these games, right, there will be points where there's going to be gambling, um, and it's in Tlachtli, it's not in Patoli that gambling or that sacrifice happens. Um, it's in Tlachtli. But there will be points where um, two 
kings, two emperor, two well, not two emperors, but an emperor and a king or two nobles uh, will gamble. And one of the things they gamble is their team. Um, depending on the outcome, right, that team will be sacrificed, right? Now, a lot of people get really concerned. They're like, well, that's just not fair. It sucks to be that player. Why would you want to play? But if you think about it, right, it's akin. If we think about Christianity, one of the biggest things in terms of Christianity is that is Christ's sacrifice for people, right? Nobody says, like, is there sadness there? Yeah, there's sadness there. But there's also that sort of idea of love and hope that comes with Christ's sacrifice. So in this case, these people, as they are being sacrificed, right, are being sacrificed for the better, the betterment of their, their community and their, um, and like, and their society and their friends and their family. And there's not, I mean, yes, some people who get sacrificed are not excited to get sacrificed. Absolutely. But some people who get sacrificed are, are fine with that. Um, and at some points I can't remember who I was talking to about this the other day, but, um, like, just imagine if you played a game and it's, I mean, it's the best game of your life and you go out on that Fiero moment, right? I mean, that's pretty big high to go out on, right? I mean, um, <laughs> but it's, it's that, that, um, so some sacrifices are going to happen, but it's sacrifices really to save society as opposed to that exoticization of like, oh my God, they're killing people. And that's like, yes they're killing people, but it's not, it, there's a reason that the society supports behind it and the people going to it know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so if people want to dig further into this topic, uh, what are some reading materials that you recommend that they look at that are going to be understandable and also quality? So, Barbara Voorhees, um, and I can give you the name of that, has uh, is the editor of a book that just came out, um, I want to say 2019, but COVID timing has my brain sort of melting a little bit. Um, and it's uh, Games of, I want to say it's Games of North American Indians. I've got it here. I'll make sure I get it to you, um, which is really great. It's got a lot of sort of pre-contact uh, indigenous games for North America, South America, Mesoamerica. Um, there's my forthcoming piece is going to be out in July, I want to say, maybe October. Um, it's a chapter in 500 Years of Franciscans. Uh, and it's looking, it's a thought piece as opposed to a, a hard dive. And then really not a lot has been done on sort of this cultural exchange. Um, I'm two chapters into writing my book that's yet to be titled. Um, that I'm hoping to have done in the next year to year and a half. Um, so if you're wanting stuff on uh, Europe, there's a lot more, not necessarily, well, there's some that's on a little bit of cultural exchange uh, that's over there. So there's a ton of stuff on chess that you can look into. Um, I just finished reading uh, Marilyn Yalomes and some historians might be upset that I'm pointing her out over other sources, but it's incredibly readable. Um, and it's, it looks at the role of the, it's called the chess queen and it looks at the role of the chess queen and how that evolves um, tied into culture, which is kind of cool. And so the chess queen uh, actually starts out as a vizier. And as it goes, um, she sort of puts forward this idea that the chess queen um, becomes the strongest piece in chess because of the women who are queens in that moment. But it's also really important to understand we um, women played chess in uh, the early modern period and the medieval period, and they were avid players. Uh, and today we have, right, the, net, the Netflix scene, the Queen, or the Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. People are like, look, it's getting women to play chess. And, but women played chess, like they eventually stopped playing chess. Uh, but it was also interesting to read about this because chess was like tied into courting your partner, uh, which makes the term checkmate uh, a whole lot different, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh there's there's a good source there and then um again i can i can provide you a list of some other fun sources on like cards and things like that too that'd be amazing and then it's gonna go in the show notes everybody but where can we google you 
<laughs> um, so I'm at Central Michigan University. If you Google my name, it'll pull it up there. Or similarly, this uh, Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations is based there. Well, we are also on Facebook. Uh, if you look for the Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations and Twitter. Um, but yeah, it's our ridiculous handle is too long to just sort of spout off, unfortunately. So it'll be in the show notes. <laughs> Yes, it will. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. This was super interesting and hopefully a starting point for me and for a lot of other people to explore what you've been exploring because it sounds awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Happy gaming, everybody. <laughs>